Hi, my name is Frank Straza. In this video, I'm going to take you on a journey while I make this rocking chair, from selecting the wood to cutting the joinery, all the way to putting the oil on the chair. The intent for this video was just a primer for those taking my in-person class on how to make this chair. There are many steps in the video process that I could go much further in depth on, including cutting the angled joinery, the rockers, and the arms. And maybe in the future, I will do another more in-depth video series on making this chair. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy the video and hopefully it whets your appetite for furniture making. Maybe inspires you to take an in-person class with me. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to my channel. Let's get started. So here are the two boards that are gonna make this rocking chair. And before I begin, I'm gonna take my pattern and lay it out on the board. You'll also see here that I'm actually trying to find the best grain that will match and then also looking for knots. You know, you'll see you'll find a knot. Uh, you want to work around that and uh, of course uh, try to find the best material here. Then what I'll do is I'll take a cr lumber crayon and kind of just rough mark out the material um, and then cross cut it um, to rough length using both a skill saw and then sometimes a chop saw depending on, on the piece of wood. So consulting here my cut list, I'm going to now start cutting the thinner pieces of wood uh, on this piece of four quarter rough cherry. Again, rough marking. Then I'll go over to the table saw and just kind of rough rip that material. Again, this is not final dimensions, this is just bulking it down. I'm going to use the bandsaw as well to bulk down the legs. Then I'll come over to the joiner and just face joint this material. Again, by bulking it down into smaller components, it makes the face jointing a lot easier. You have better use of your material. Now I'm going to mark the face with a pencil and then go over to the planer. Again, face down and then plane the other, thicknessing the material to the proper thickness according to the material list. Okay, now that I have um, thickness the material, the next step is to place the pattern on here and to go ahead and trace it out. I am going to focus, however, on cutting this cut right here because this is super important that this knee gets uh, positioned in the right place right here. So we're going to go ahead and cut just this side out first. I'm using the bandsaw here to cut that front face first. Just make this cut as straight as you possibly can using the bandsaw. I've got a big bandsaw here, but even a 14 inch would work just fine for this. After you've cut just this front, then we're gonna come over to the jointer and joint this nice and straight. Then we'll come back to the table saw, set it to the final width and cut right to the center there and then flip it over. You'll notice here we're going to flip this over and we're going to cut the other side again right to the exact thickness before we finish it up on the bandsaw. Again we don't want to cut too far or else we're going to mess up the back of the leg. So again you'll notice that we're going to finish just that last little bit on the bandsaw right in the inside corner. What I'm doing here now is ganging the two front legs together and measuring and marking the mortise location together. It's important to mark the actual face with an arrow. And now I'm going to set the mortise gauge to the 3 8 3 8 between the two points and 3 8 from the fence to the first point. And you'll notice here I'm going to put a pinpoint and I'm going to mark the mortise location. It's important to do this even though you're going to cut some of this by hand, some of it with a mortiser, I always like to mark the exact location with the mortise gauge. Doing the same thing to the back legs as well, ganging them together and marking them simultaneously, both of them together. Then carry the lines across to the inside faces where the mortises are. Marking from the knee down is super important. You'll see that on the plans. Again, using the mortise gauge, we're going to mark the actual mortise location. 
Now, you'll notice here I'm going to start chopping the mortise, and there's a couple ways to do this. We can do it either by hand or with the 3 8 chisel. Of course, if you're going to do it with the chisel, you want to make sure that that mortise is perfectly straight. The bevel is away, and I'm always traveling away, so I'll start that mortise and then work from one side, working away from myself. Again, the bevel is away from me. Then, this takes a few passes. Uh, I'll work it in both directions, and then I'll clean up the bottom. Sometimes with a smaller chisel is helpful, but all of this is done with a 3 8 chisel just chopping it away. It doesn't take too terribly long to do this if it's done correctly. Coming back with a quarter inch chisel, you can clean up the bottom, the material out of the bottom. One of the things you want to be careful of is that you don't damage the ends of the mortises. And you'll notice I'll, I'll clean those up after. Now I'm checking the depth, super important. Make sure that you are at the correct depth. Then mark the sides which are gonna have the angled mortises. Super important here because the angle is very subtle. I just use blue tape and mark it. Now I wanna show you using the mortiser. The mortiser is actually a very effective and fast way to create these mortises. Using a 3 8 mortise bit, the mortiser will really create an accurate mortise. Again, Having this laid out with the mortise gauge is super helpful. Now always double check the depth, make sure that you don't go too deep. Now we're going to cut the angled mortises and I've created a little angled jig here. It's a very subtle angle and that angle is going to be created by this little jig. Again, marking the angle here to make sure that we are going the right way. It's easy to get this reversed and going the wrong way. You want to make sure that that angle is going in the correct direction. Now I'm going to finish rip the smaller components to size. Again, just coming over the table saw, joint one edge, then rip it to final width. Then I like to use a crosscut sled to cross these to exact dimension. This is really important that these are cut exactly to dimension, so I'm cutting all of the front pieces, the back pieces are all exactly the same. I cut one end and then I measure, set up a stop, and cut the other end. And this helps you really get everything to exact dimension. Of course, if you're cutting the tenons by hand, this isn't as important, but if you're gonna cut the tenons with a machine, it's super important that these are cut to precisely the same length. Okay, now what I'm going to do is, being that I'm going to show you how to cut these by hand, I'm going to mark the face and the edge, and then I'm going to gang them together. So in this case, these are the two front pieces, and they're the exact same length. So these two pieces, the front top rail and the front bottom rail, are going to be ganged together. And then I'm going to scribe both of these together at the same time, because the shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder length is what's super important here. I'm marking one inch from the end, which is the length of the tenon. But again, I'm going to scribe this together. So you'll see I'll put a little knife prick there, then bring the square right up to that knife, and then scribe it. Then I will measure shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder length and mark the other side. Again, doing both of these together. Super important that that shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder length is exactly the same size. Again, put the knife in there and then scribe it. Scribe it lightly at first and then heavier. Then you can take it apart and you can carry that knife line around, and you'll see I'll do that on each one, working off of the face and the edge. And this will help you ensure that that scribe line is scribed all the way around and that it meets up perfectly, as you can see right there, just perfectly. Again, because I've worked off of the face and the edge, and you'll see I'm doing that on the upper front rail. Okay, so you can see there's the edge, and you can see here now I'm putting the square up against that edge, and then carrying that line, scribing it across, and then you'll see I'll put it on the face, and then catch it right in there, and then scribe that as well. This really ensures that that line will be precisely aligned. Now I'm going to set that same gauge. Now I've reset it to where that tenon is actually centered. Okay, so the fence to the first pin is actually going to be different. 
double checking, making sure that it is indeed three eighths or the ten in width, and then scribing that, scribing that all along, working from the face. Super important that you mark these tenons from the face. Now, deepen that knife line and then use a chisel to create a knife wall. This gives you a great place to be able to track the saw. Okay, so start the saw at the back there and then the front and then connect the two, working across, going right to your depth. And this is cutting the shoulders. We're cutting the shoulders here. And I'm using a dovetail saw, which I like because it has fine teeth. Again, using the knife, deepen that knife cut. You can also come across with the chisel of a slicing motion. This is really fast and effective. Then using the saw working, you see, there, there, and then across the face. Now I'm using a tenon saw to actually cut the cheeks. This is probably the hardest way to do this. It takes a lot of skill, but it's very fast and effective. It just takes a little bit more control, and you have to have a well-tuned tenon saw. And then I'm going to work this down, and then I'm going to use the dovetail saw to just work that shoulder the last little bit. Now, again, when you're using the tenon saw, you'll see I'll start at one side and then work it across, working down, ease it so you don't go too far, and then use a chisel to just clean up that last little bit. Just here's another view showing how I start right in that front corner there. Then I'll slowly rock the saw down, working it down to the line. And it's very fast and effective. Another way to do it is to use a chisel splitting with the grain. You have to be very careful with this method, though, because it's easy to uh, go too far, especially if the grain is not going straight. So I'm working above the line, splitting off the bulk of the wood, then you'll notice what I'll do here is I'll actually come across the grain working finally the line. This is way more accurate than just splitting it straight because splitting it straight you can actually go way past the line. See, working across the grain here and then just cleaning that up really carefully with the chisel. It's got to be a sharp chisel. Then you'll notice I'm going to use a router plane here. Using a router plane actually is super effective because you can keep that tenon perfectly parallel You'll have to adjust the depth so you don't go too thin. You don't want to go too thin with this tenon, but it really helps keep that tenon nice and straight and parallel, which is uh, hard to do just alone with the chisel. Coming back here with a wider chisel to just clean up a little bit on the wall. Don't want to widen it too much. And then a quarter inch chisel just to get a little bit of that remainder from the mortiser out of the bottom there, just ensuring that nothing is going to keep that tenon from going all the way inside that mortise. You can also use a rabbit block plane here to clean up the tenons. Just want to be careful that the lateral adjustment set, that it's not set too deep. Okay, then test one corner here. And then we'll test the other corner to make sure that it goes in. And that's how you can fine tune it. And then, you know, you can see where the high spots are. I can see it's a little high right there. So I'm going to take the rabbit block plane. Again, really finely set, very finely set. Take a little bit off there and then fit it in. And it should fit beautifully. And you can use a rubber mallet to just kind of knock that in. So set up a square to make sure this is going in perfectly 90 degrees. Now I want to mark which side is which. Another way to do this is with the dado blade. I actually prefer this method uh, because it's fast and effective. Again, you have to make sure everything is cut the exact correct length because we're working off of the fence creating the tenon. So you see I have a, a backer board and we're just cutting the tenon with a three quarter inch dado blade. This keeps everything perfectly flat and parallel. Next, I'm going to turn my attention to cutting the tenons for the curved parts, which have an offset tenon because of the curve. Just make sure you lay that out correctly prior to cutting. The next step here is turn our attention towards the angle joinery. What I'm going to do is take an actual measurement off of the back of the chair and the front of the chair, and then transfer that to a piece of plywood, working off of the center line. Then I can create the angle directly from that and transfer that for the angled tenons. So the next step here is to cut the angled shoulders. The actual tenon is straight, but the shoulder is angled. These are for the side pieces. I'm marking it, then I'm gonna set up the saw at an angle and I'm gonna cut one side only, then flip it end for end. You'll see there, end for end. 
and then cut the other one. And I'm using a stop as well. This is just cutting the angled shoulder. I had previously cut the cheeks of the tenon with the dado blade. Again, these are straight. So now I'm, again, just cutting the shoulders, making sure the angles are going in the correct direction. You can fine tune the shoulders with the knife and the square and then chisel them if need be. Being that the angle is very subtle, chiseling the angle is quite effective. You can also set up a bevel square indicating the correct angle and this makes this work very effective and very straightforward. In order to do the angle on the other side, you actually have to move the stop on the other side of the crosscut sled. This is really the only way to create this angle because the saw obviously only tilts in one direction. Again, getting these shoulders lined up perfectly is the key. Once you've created the angled shoulders, then you have to determine which is left and right. I'm marking an arrow here, determining which is left and right. The pieces are actually interchangeable until we actually cut the top shoulder, which would then determine which is going to be the left and right. So make sure that you mark the left and right and then scribe and chisel away that top shoulder. Do the same thing on the other side. Again, this is only done on the top top face. The bottom is actually flush because you want everything to be lined up on the bottom. So this is only done on the top edge. Okay, now I'm going to turn my attention back to making sure the inside of the mortises are nice and clean. Sometimes the mortiser will leave a little bit of debris in there and just cleaning up the sides um, with a wide chisel and then the ends with the 3 8 chisel and then the bottom of course with the quarter inch chisel is a helpful way to make sure that everything is clean inside. Now I'm going to mark the width of the actual tenon and again this is shouldered only on the top edge. Marking that, cutting it, chiseling it, and then fitting it in the same exact way that we've done all of the other tenons. If you'll notice here when I'm fitting this, I actually use a rocking motion. Also set up a square to make sure it's going in 90 degrees. But that rocking motion, you can feel where it's actually tight and then remove the material with the rabbit block plane. Again, making sure it's nice and sharp. Lateral adjustment is set right, making sure that the plane is not tilted to one side. You can, of course, use the uh, router plane as well. But the rabbit block plane makes quick work of this. Then fit it all the way in. I fit these pieces prior to cutting the actual curves. You'll see I'm dry fitting here the back frame to make sure everything lines up. And all of these tenons, the shoulder to shoulder length is exactly the same. Dry fit it with a clamp, making sure it pulls up together, making sure the shoulders are all nice and tight. Now I'm going to fit the angled rails. Again, fitting them again here with the rabbit block plane, which I love. And then you'll also notice too, I can set up that bevel square to the correct angle, making sure that these pieces go in at the correct angle. Super important to make sure that the whole chair lines up perfectly. I'm actually going to dry fit this together and put clamps on it to make sure that the shoulders pull up nicely. Now I can cut the curves for the back, top and bottom rails. Cutting these on the bandsaw. Cut the inside and the outside. Then I'm going to clean it up with a hand plane. I find that using a number four plane works the best for the outside curve because it's the best way to create a nice fair curve. Long, smooth, even strokes is the best way to create that fair curve. Using a spoke shave to actually clean up the inside is the best way, of course. I like to use a Stanley number 51 or 151. Works great for cleaning up the inside curvature.
you'll notice that I'm actually skewing the spokeshave, and that is really an effective way to be able to traverse across some of the bandsaw marks and get a nice, even, fair curve on the inside. It gives you a nice slicing motion as you're working the spokeshave. Work from the top down to the center, and then flip it over and work from the other side. What I'm doing here is marking where the curves are going to be for the angle pieces because once we cut the curves for the angle pieces, we have finally determined which is going to be the left and right. Once that's marked, then I can just come over to the bandsaw and cut those curves out. These are only for the upper rails on the chair. Then I'm going to use a spoke shave to fair that curve and smooth it up, clean it up, make it nice and even, working from the top down into the center. You can actually create your own pattern by cutting one of the curves and then transferring that to the other side. It's time to lay out the mortises for the back slats. This is done with the dividers, just stepping it off equally, starting from the center point, working in either direction. I'm now going to use a little homemade block that's a half an inch wide, and it's got a little shoulder cut on it, and this allows me to be able to create the marks for where the mortises are going to be for these back slats. Next, I want to set the mortise gauge to a half inch chisel because I'm going to mark for the back slats. I'm marking from the outside curve, putting a point in, and then sliding this mortise gauge up marking that carefully. Next, I just want to mark which is the waist with a little X. You don't want to inadvertently cut the mortise in the wrong location after all this work. I use a mortiser with a half inch bit to actually create these mortises for the back slats. It's really the most effective way to cut these mortises. I'll come back with a chisel and clean out any remaining remnants that are left from the mortiser. Using an air hose really works well to clean out some of the excess debris in there as well. Then I'll use a hand plane to just finalize the width of these slats to make sure that they fit in there. You don't want them fitting in there too tight, but go ahead and dry fit the whole back together and uh, using a rubber mallet to put them in. It's a little tricky to put this top one in, but if you work from one end and kind of work from all the way across, it works quite effectively and it'll go in there. Again, another reason not to make them too tight, but then again, you don't want them too loose either because they will rattle. Once it's fit, then you want to measure to make sure it's the same distance. Now what I'm going to do here is uh, mark the top tenons for the arms. These are on the front posts. Using the knife and the square, I'm going to scribe around. Then I'm going to set the mortise gauge for the width of the top tenon and scribe that centered on the top of the post. Put it in the vise. actually makes easy work of scribing that tenon. Now what I'm going to do here is actually cut the cheeks first. That is, I'm going to go straight down with the grain prior to cutting the shoulders. And you'll notice I'm going to cut all of these cuts. There's four cuts going straight down. Once those are done, then I can cut the shoulders. If I cut the shoulders first, then I would inadvertently remove my lines. This is the most effective way to do this. Strengthen that knife line, come back with a chisel, create the knife wall, and then cut the shoulders. Here I'm using a couple of my dovetail saws. I like to use them because the teeth are fine and they're quite effective for this type of work. One down and one more to go, using here a tenon saw to cut the cheeks. Makes quick work of it. The next step is to use a plane to surface all of the material. 
I'll use a combination of tools, but here I like to start with the hand plane, a high angle hand plane, as it works well if you have some grain that's going in the wrong direction. After I use the hand plane, I'll use other tools as well. Then I'll use a block plane to cut the edges, to ease the edges here. I'll also use a spoke shave to ease the edges on the curved rails as well. I'm using a number 80 cabinet scraper to work the surface of these rails. It all depends. Sometimes I'll use a plane, sometimes I'll use the scraper. It really depends on the grain. Here I'm using a card scraper. This is really the final tool prior to sanding. I really love the card scraper and you can refer to one of my other videos where I show you how to sharpen the card scraper. As I showed you earlier, using the plane in a long sweeping motions is a great way to finish up the curves on the back rails. And then you can, again, use the card scraper. It's an amazing tool. It works very effectively. It also works on the inside of the curves as well. Finishing the nine back rails can be somewhat tedious, but set the plane very, very fine. You don't want to take off too much material. You're just trying to smooth it up and then cut all the edges with the block plane. You'll also want to plane the back legs, again, setting the plane very, very fine. Here I'm going to come back on the top of the legs with a block plane and chamfer the edges. This gives it a nice look. You'll see I'm skewing the block plane and working all four edges. Dare I bring out such a modern tool as my fest tool, but I love my fest tool sander. Using 220 grit brings everything to an even texture because the surfaces have been done with different tools such as the different scrapers plane, so the sandpaper is the way to go. In this video, I'm actually not gluing the chair because it's a demonstration chair that I want to be taken apart later. But if I was gluing it, of course, I would dry fit it first, as you see I'm doing here. But then I would glue it in sections. So I would glue just the back frame first and then clamp that and set it aside. Next, I'm going to assemble the front frame, and in this case I would glue that, clamp it, and again set it aside. Once the front and the back frame is dry, then I would proceed to glue the side pieces and clamp it up. This is really the best, most effective way to assemble, glue and assemble this chair. Next, I'm going to dry clamp this. In this case, if I was gluing it, I would clamp this. Make sure to use calls to protect the edge of the chair. Now I want to scribe where the angled blocks are going to go. These are going to actually help hold the seat into place. Pre-drill the holes to where the screw fits loosely through the hole. You can countersink it slightly and then we'll actually attach that to the corners here using some fasteners. I like to clamp this in place, just makes it easier, and then screw the pieces in. The next step here is to lay out the mortises in the arm pieces. You'll notice I'm leaving the arm pieces square and doing all of the layout prior to cutting the curves. Accurate layout here is super important. Refer to the plans to get the proper measurements. But we want to transfer the exact measurement of the tenon onto the arms. I'll do this with a combination of using both uh, measuring devices, the dividers, 
as well as the actual mortise gauges I'm doing here. So I'm taking the exact width of the tenon, making sure it's super accurate. I'm transferring that width of that tenon directly over to the arm, again working with the grain with this mortise gauge. Working across the grain, I'm actually going to knife line one edge of the mortise, then use a dividers to transfer that measurement because this is actually going across the grain. The cross grain cut has to be done with the knife. With the grain can be done with the mortise gauge. The cross grain cut has to be done with the knife. That's why I'm using the dividers in this case, marking this extremely accurately with the dividers. You'll see I'm now going to transfer that divider measurement over to the arm, put a little point in there, then use the knife and the square to mark that accurately. Of course, I rough marked it with a pencil so I wouldn't go beyond the line with the knife when I'm doing this. Once that's done, then I want to transfer those marks to the underneath side. So I'm marking this first on the top edge of the arm. Then I'm going to transfer those marks to the underneath of the arm. And you'll notice I'm putting the knife just in the edge of the arm and then carefully transferring those marks over to the other side very accurately. And that's the best way to get that mortise marked to the other side of the arm. Then, of course, you can use the same mortise gauge to actually transfer the lines as well to the other side with the grain. I like to outline the marks with a pencil, it's just easier to see. Next, I'm going to create a nice little knife wall around here with the chisel, defining that edge. Once I start chiseling, working across the grain, I can be fairly aggressive with the chisel. Working with the grain, however, I have to be very careful because I could actually split the arm out. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually chisel from both sides to the center. So working with the grain, I'm going to use more of a paring motion and across the grain I can use the mallet. I'm going to undercut it as well. You see I flipped it over and now working from both sides to the center, cleaning it out very carefully and that gives me a nice clean mortise. Now put the square in from the underneath side of the arm and make sure that it meets up tight on the outside. This is a great way to check it. And then of course, if there needs to be some taken off, you can simply just use the knife and the chisel and pair it, just undercutting to the inside. Start by fitting it upside down. Then flip it over and fit it the other way. This will ensure that you get a nice tight fit where it matters, which is on the top edge. Now we're going to turn our attention towards cutting the dado in the back leg, which will actually help support the arm. We start by getting the angle from the back leg and then measuring up and then transferring that angle and scribing across using the chisel and knife wall method will create uh, a dado that's about an eighth of an inch deep. Once you've created one side of that dado, use the arm to get the exact width. Put a little knife mark there and then use the bevel square to scribe that line across. Again, use the chisel to create the knife wall. I'm going to use the marking gauge here to mark the absolute depth that I need to go to and then, of course, saw to that depth and then chisel away the material. Sometimes the inevitable happens and a little chip will come out. Here I am just using a little glue and tape to glue in that last little piece to make sure I don't lose it, and then uh, using a chisel to pare down to the depth of that cut.
you want to be careful here. You'll notice I'm really supporting that chisel and keeping my fingers out of the way as I chisel down to that line. You can also use a router plane too to finish up this cut. Working from both sides to the center as not to blow out that material. Once you've created that back dado, now what I'm going to do is create the angle in the arm. And I'll set that up next to the mortise and then use a pencil to mark that back angle. Using a square here, I'm going to measure over how far I need to put that cut in the back arm and then scribe that with a marking gauge and cut it. Here I am setting up the cutting gauge to the exact measurement and setting that just right. I'll then scribe that on both sides so I have a clear mark on both sides. Again, working off of the same edge. Saw down to that cut and then I'll use the band saw to cut that and then finish it up with a chisel. Go ahead and dry fit it in place, hammer it down, make sure it fits well. I like to use a fastener in the back. Make sure to pre-drill through that back leg so the screw fits loosely through the back leg and then screw in the arm. Then use the pattern, transfer the curves, and bandsaw it out. Use the spoke shave to fare the curves. It's really the best way to smooth out those curves working downhill, working with the grain. It's a little tricky working the end grain, but as you can see, I brace it against my stomach. I skew the spoke shave and then cut the edges, making it comfortable to the touch. Now we're going to trace the arc for the rockers, and I'm doing this with a homemade trammel point. Mark one of the curves and then simply bandsaw it out and hand plane it with the number four and a half long sweeping strokes will give you a nice fair curve. Also check it with the square. Make sure that's nice and square and then sight down it to make sure that's a nice even fair curve so that it rocks evenly. Once that's done I'm going to use the marking gauge and scribe along to create the inside curve and then bandsaw that out. Once that's bandsawn out, then you can use a spoke shave on that inside curve, making that nice and even. Use that rocker as a pattern to create the other rocker. Next, measure up on the front leg and the back leg and transfer those lines down. Next, measure over on the front edge of the rocker to determine how far the rocker should be positioned from the front. Then set the rocker on the legs and transfer that arc. After you've transferred the arc, use a 3 8 chisel to create the length for the tenon. This is the part that you're going to actually cut off. Add that 3 8 then scribe down and cut off the excess of the legs. This can be a little tricky holding the chair as the chair wants to move, but clamp it carefully to the bench. Once you've cut off the excess of the legs, now it's time to form the tenons. I'm going to set the marking gauge, and this measurement is not super important, but I like to center that tenon on to the actual legs. Scribe carefully around. Now I'm going to carefully transfer the shoulder lines from the rocker around those legs using both the square and the bevel square. Then saw the cheeks of those tenons down to the line. Just like we did for the tenon on the top of the front leg, we want to saw 
the cheeks first before cutting the shoulders for these robbers. Now we can cut the shoulders very carefully. Now set the chair carefully up on the rockers, aligning them just right, and trace around those tenons, defining the mortises on the rockers. Also mark the direction in which the mortises will go, and then ch chisel them using the hollow chisel mortiser. Make sure you don't go too deep here. Just shallow, 3 8 of an inch deep is all you need. Clean up the mortises with a chisel. Use caution when working across the grain here because of the angle of the mortise, the grain wants to chip out, so chisel that carefully. Again, make sure you don't go too deep. Double check the depth. and then pair the shoulders of the tenons on the rocking chair legs. Chamfer the ends of the tenons, and then fit the rockers in place. I hope this isn't heresy, but I actually use screws to hold the rockers in place. I don't countersink the screws, I just barely set them below the surface, giving plenty of material for the screw to hold onto. Use a spoke shave to round the edges of the outside of the rockers. Next up we will cut and shape the corbels which support the arms and they also add a decorative element. Using a chisel, spoke shave, as well as a rasp, this is the best way to clean up these corbels. A long sweeping motion with the file will help you fare these curves. Next I use a card scraper to kind of just clean everything up and give it that final finish. Again my favorite tool is this card scraper and as you can see here it just works beautifully on the inside of the rockers. Don't take off too much, you don't want to misshape where the tenons are going to fit into those mortises. Well, we're almost done. Now it's time to put the first coat of oil on the chair. I use a blend that I create myself. This is a Danish oil blend, a mixture of linseed oil, mineral spirits, and spar varnish. I actually add a little Japan dryer as well. Put the oil on fairly evenly and liberally. The first coat will soak in nice. After the first coat dries, about a day or so, then you can lightly sand it with 400 grit and add another coat. Of course, make sure to dispose of your rags properly. Lay them out flat to dry. Oily rags can spontaneously combust if they're left crumpled together. Next, let's make the seat. I'm starting here with a piece of three quarter inch plywood. I fit it with a fair gap all the way around to allow for the leather. I've drilled four holes in it to allow for air to escape when you sit in the chair. And I like to use this green foam because it's easy to cut on the bandsaw actually. Trace around it, cut it out on the bandsaw. I even cut little angles on it so that the fabric will fold over the edge nicely. I'm going to start by using a fabric that's usually used on the underneath side of seats and I'm going to use that to go all the way around the foam and this will help kind of shape the actual chair seat. Just simply staple it in place with a stapler, either a hand stapler or an electric stapler. Sometimes it's helpful to actually get on top of the actual seat and press the foam in place while stapling it. This will give you a nice even curve to the seat.
work the front and back, then the sides. Then trim the corners and staple them. Once the seat covering is done, then we can select some of the leather, cut out the leather with about three inches oversize. I use the same technique as I did to put the seat covering on to put the leather on. I start on one edge, put a staple in the middle, and then evenly pull the leather tight and staple it. Next work the opposite edge, forming it nice and even. Again, staple the middle. Putting the leather on is actually a bit easier now that the foam has been formed in place with the liner. Doing the corners is a little tricky, but just remove the excess with a knife or a scissors. Simply fold it neatly, bring it over, and staple it in place. Now the moment of truth. Let's see how the seat fits into the chair. Ah, fits in there beautifully. And then even more, let's see how it rocks. Thanks for following me along for this video. Of course, there's no substitute for actually taking a class to learn how to make this chair. But hopefully some of these techniques that I've shared with you will inspire you and help you in the making of your rocking chair. Thanks for watching.